Hello, everyone. Welcome to Brave Storytime. My name is Lisa Karasek, moderator for Brave Storytime, and I am today here today with Natalie Pe Peterson, um, one of our authors, and she's going to be reading to us today. She's going to be reading her chapter, which is chapter 23 from the book titled Sacred Rebel. And your title is called Shot Through My Heart. And I have to say, every time I've worked on this event for you, I just keep getting Bon Jovi in my head over, <laughs> over and over again. So either I love you or I hate you. I haven't figured it out yet, but. <laughs> so there, there are worse, there's worse songs to have stuck in your head. Like I said, that the other day I had Hokey Pokey and I would have given anything for a Bon Jovi song. <laughs> sidetrack really quickly so you know the song of all songs that will always get every other song out of your head when you need to get a song out of your head you know oh yeah still the beans give me everybody was kung fu fighting oh dear yeah we're gonna I, I every time <laughs> i may not like you by the time this is over with that one stuck in my head thanks but so much lisa everything else out <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> So tell me, Natalie, how did you come to be in Sacred Rebel? Oh, wow. I, Sacred Rebel is a, um, a book in a series that lead authors, Stephanie Urbina Jones and Jeremy Pager, uh, have taken on, um, and Shaman Heart Sacred Rebel, I believe is their second one. Um, and they've got another one, um, I mean, on the, on the near horizon, but the, the framework around it is actually an author's journey. And, um, so the writing portion of it is almost an output of not almost, but is an output of a week long, uh, experience that we, we took in the, um, we traveled down to outside of Mexico city to the pyramids of Teotihuacan and stayed at an absolutely amazing place called the dreaming house. And over the course of a week, uh, Laura DeFranco, Stephanie and Jeremy, uh, and a couple of others, um, guided us through everything from writer's workshops to ceremonies. Um, we walked on fire. We, uh, we did a sweat lodge. Um, there was, um, uh, a, a ceremony around breaking arrows with our necks. Um, so the, the ritual and ceremony and, and, um, just the entire experience was meant to dive into this part of your life. Um, typically around adolescence where you're coming into your sense of self and you're coming into this state of aliveness that you are, working to kind of measure against the status quo and the status quo is taught through to you through your parents through school through teachers um today's kids have social media and we're 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 bumping up against status quo with ourselves like who we really who, who we are expressing ourselves to be and the status quo um represented by all of these different people and books and media is telling us which parts aren't okay you know that, yeah, that's a little much. No, that's a little, you're, you, you need probably need to put that under hat. Right. And that sacred rebel part of us starts to be suppressed and we start to, to squash, um, and, and, and become mm, muted and, um, that rebel part that wants to break out, that wants to sing at the top of her lungs, that wants to, um, curse and smoke and have sex and, you know, all of these things that are, you know, just naturally part of growing up. Um, we went back and we rediscovered that and, and we went and reclaimed it through these ceremonies and through these, um, these writing workshops. And so then we came back to real life, which was a total trip and is a whole nother conversation to produce this chapter. Each of us, there were 25 of us and each of us then took pen to paper and went back to that sacred rebel self and um, reclaimed and, and remembered and brought back to life and honored um, perhaps a, a, for me, a young woman that I abandoned 
um, you know, for any number of reasons. Um, and so that's what, that's what my chapter is about, um, is as part of Shaman Heart Sacred Rebel is um, the experience around a very specific part of my life that, that was pretty transformational in who I am today. So awesome yeah I think you I think you led into then um my next question which is why did you want to write this chapter I got sober that's a big part of of my story um as a as an anchor in my life as a as a turning point in my life kind of a start of an entirely different chapter um it'll be six years in November of this year I spent the first few years, I talk about it in this chapter that I'm going to read today. I spent the first few years doing really good at not drinking, but doing very little about healing. Same habits, same, I'm strong, tough, stoic, not going to, you know, and other addictive behaviors took the place of alcohol. Um, It wasn't until... I connected and got out of my own way, stuck my hand out and, and came into community with Stephanie, Jeremy, Tina Green, um, that I started to unwind, uh, and really start to examine all the reasons, um, why I was addicted to alcohol and suffering and and so on and so forth. The chapter was a very important part of my, of my healing journey. It was a, you, there was no choice, but to write it. This is a story that's been knocking around in my brain for my entire adult life. So it really demanded to be put to paper and just released. Beautiful. Writing these chapters are definitely very healing for sure. You think you're there and then you write it and you're like, oh yeah, I needed that too. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. The process of letting it go, letting it see the, letting it see air, letting other people see it, um, being witnessed, Mm -hmm. trudging, trudging. I mean, like, no, I'm not going to show myself, you know, the, like letting this story be seen, like the true, this vulnerability and, and really what, you know, so, so much feedback, not so much, but several instances of feedback from people that I've been close to my entire life saying, really, is that really how, how you felt? And yeah, Uh yeah, that was really me. And wow, you did a great job. We all do a great job. Yeah. And if, if I can peel a mask off, like tear it off slowly and painfully and, and get to the underside of all this, um, then hopefully, you know, giving other folks the, the inspiration to do the same. So, yeah. And now they get to see your beautiful face reading and the words out loud. Yeah. Yay! So how did it feel writing the chapter? Um, it was. So I'm a perfectionist. I think as a lot of us are, um, you know, recovering from all kinds of stuff, but in my, in my upbringing with my family, um, I was raised in a very codependent, um, household. And so people pleasing and and perfectionism has, has been my, my go-to. Um, and so it was to begin, I'm a, it was the rule following and the exactness that got in my way that I had to work through. I want, you know, the, the word, can, there are formal, you know, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Guidelines around, you know, word count and, and this leads into that and, and the formalities of writing that were, you know, screaming at me in place of a story. And it wasn't until I finally just got the story out and worked backwards, um, that I, I finally really had a lot of fun, which sounds weird because it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy chapter. It's, it's emotional. Um, but I had, it was fun writing. It was the experience of, 
um, seeing things come to life and rework. We had writing pi partners that we bounced off of um, and read to, and and my best, my soul sister, Nancy, um, heard it. I can't even, I don't even have any idea how many times she's heard the story read to her, but just having it all refine itself, refine itself, refine itself, and then hitting send on that last last version it's ready for print was really I was really proud yeah it it really came full circle and very healing um it's not easy I hats off to people that write you know as a living wow um yeah so healing and 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 a proud moment for me to to see it come out and hear that box of, of extra books hit my doorstep it was like yes there I am so wonderful well thank you and yeah yeah so that alone tells us that we are about to receive a really big gift that is going to be a shot through our hearts so thank you mm. Are you to read yeah. your chapter please i'd love to all righty i'm gonna read straight from from my book um it is well well dog-eared um just the other the other stories that are in here are beautiful as well um, so this is chapter 23, shot through my sacred heart, reflecting on the truth of being exactly enough by Natalie Peterson. I start with a quote from a beautiful um, poet and author. Um, his name is Young Pueblo. I kept running away from my darkness until I understood that in it, I would find my freedom. My story. So how'd he do it? I'm sorry? How'd your father die? He shot himself. Oh, well, I suppose if there's a way to go, it's better faster, right? I'm sorry? The doctor didn't answer me again, but instead moved on, inelegantly scribbling on his pad a prescription to salve my mother's anguish. This isn't happening. Later that day at the mortuary, I looked down on my father's body, quiet, cold, and void of soul his decision to end his life, a harsh reality piercing through any semblance of stability, truth, loyalty, and love he had so carefully architected over the course of my childhood. I noticed the gunpowder residue on his slightly parted lips. In a strange vortex between knowing and disbelief, I placed my hand on the back of his head to feel for the exit wound, as if not finding where the bullet left would suddenly breathe oxygen back into the room, his body, and my entire life. This is happening. This is real. I didn't see this coming. I don't know where I'm going now. It was February 8th, and I dropped a silly but carefully chosen Valentine's Day card into the mail slot, double stamped to ensure delivery to my small hometown post office in Southwest Colorado. I wrote inside, I'm so proud of you, Dad. This is hard, all of this. I know, but I believe in you. I believe in your love for my mom, for our family. I love you. I'll call you soon. XO, nut. My dad called me nut. And he didn't get the card. I did. The call came to me. Well, first the ride came for me. While working a morning shift, filing campus parking tickets, my supervisor walked up stiffly to tell me Matt was out front and to go with him. Everything's fine. Just get your stuff. I'll see you soon. Awkward. It was Valentine's Day. Was this... I giggled and run wondered, rolling my eyes. A sweetheart daydream come true? Matt, an old roommate, must be playing Cupid. It was a stretch, I knew, and I felt a warm hit of embarrassment for even thinking such a thing as I stood by his car parked at the red curb on that cold, sunny day. Who could be sending for me? But Matt didn't look like he was there to surprise me with a ride to join a secret admirer. Quite the opposite, he was visibly distraught and uncomfortable. I began firing questions to try and determine what was unfolding, out of my usual control. What the fuck? I'm not going anywhere with you, Matt, if I don't have more information. I haven't seen you in months. Actually, fuck off. Tell me what's up or fuck off. It's important, Natalie. Please trust me. This is so hard, he answered, head down. He exhaled an enormous sigh of desperation, and I knew to get in. We drove in silence to the previous address where he another former roommate, and others lived. As I ascended the stairs to the main living area, they were all standing there, silent, staring, 
this isn't the Valentine's Day attention a girl dreams of. I reached for the paper towel on the counter in front of me. On it, digits were written in blue ink, the thin paper having torn under the pressure of the ballpoint pen. 970-884-2. I knew the number. Pastor Dan from the church in which I grew up was the one who began the search for me earlier that day. The university had an old address. I'd called and talked to Matt. He then got to track me down and bring me to a phone to call the number to find out my father had taken his own life that morning. Dan called me first, wondered if I wanted to be the person to tell my mother. I'm sorry, what? I asked. Uh, no, that's on you. Don't you train for this kind of shit? This. Yeah, this is some shit. I crumbled to my knees and my young rebel heart doubled over. This is some shit and definitely not the Valentine's Day surprise. I didn't even know I was secretly hoping for. You're too old for that crap. And there are four men staring at me in the fetal position on this dirty wood floor. And what is your next move? It has to be forward, but I'm falling. You tell her, I said into the phone. Her. My mom. She had conquered doubt and found courage enough to take the first steps in saving her marriage and family to get sober. The situation wasn't always so ugly. It was idyllic, actually. Our little Colorado clan lived modestly. My father was a farrier, builder, and small engine repairman, and my mother was a florist, creative, substitute teacher, and devoted wife and mom. They were both deeply committed to their faith, and my brother and I spent our youth playing amidst pews and at Sunday school. I found immense joy in church plays, camps, and events. I would be saved as many times as they'd allow me. I sang alongside my parents in the choir and was an active young member of the congregation that would, on special days, hear from my father, so poetic, in sermon and in prayer. If we weren't at a church, scouting, or school function, free days were spent gathering treasures and making memories in the surrounding woods. Horny toads, flowers, fossils, and bonfires my young life was rich with the gifts and adventures of the outdoors. My father, a skilled archer, harvested an animal each fall to feed us all winter. We feasted on fresh catches of trout from the river year round. Dad made furniture from willow branches and followed, fallen timber, and mom would sew cushions and covers to make it all ours. It was my junior year in high school when I discovered a six pack of Coors in the refrigerator. Though I was already drinking, smoking cigarettes and weed, playing with other drugs, a teen rebelling against my conservative upbringing, and creating waves of my own, I didn't have any memory of alcohol in my home, ever. Seeing that, seeing one beer gone, was profound. Your dad had a bad day, my mother explained with an unfamiliar tone. An unsettling feeling swelled in my stomach. Beer soon turned to wine, wine turned to whiskey. The drinking and drama and dysfunction grew exponentially. In no time, frolicking in the forest, uninhibited by worry, was a life forgotten, and I resentfully took on the roles of parent and police, trying to keep a lid on the disorder, incensed at the mess and incongruence of it all. We were no longer the family I cherished as a child. When it was time to leave for college, I fled. It's always better when you come home, my brother would share, along with details of disarray and increasing levels of intoxication and tension. Eventually, I began hearing from others as my parents' attempts at keeping it all together made for chatter around town. I was crushed and defeated by what my family had become. I stayed away from what I no longer recognized as home. Vacillating between feelings of loathing and love, I was resentful and begged for the ugliness to resolve itself. When I visited, I always left feeling relieved not to have to witness anymore and guilty for leaving my brother to bear the load. I was confused and I silenced the den of my thoughts in my own mind-numbing activities, nursing a growing list of self-limiting beliefs, most significantly that I was not enough. One of the last times I came for a long weekend, I returned from a late night out to my father having lost my mother. I followed the sound of his desperate calls of my mother's name into the dark night behind our trailer. I walked up behind him in his worn green bathrobe, slung open as he bent over and under the bull-sized propane drum that fed into my home. He was a mess of tears, worry, and the type of tense, slobbering confusion that comes inside the handle of cheap whiskey and another night of fighting to feel something more than worthless. He was looking for my mother. There was old snow on the ground. Are you fucking kidding me? I hissed. He turned to look at the voice penetrating his stupor. He didn't recognize me. Dad, 
I touched his shoulder in pity and anger, concern and contempt. What the fuck is going on? Where is my mom? I lost her, he answered. She's gone. And then I heard her. I raced the 30 feet of our backyard and pulled my mother from the freezing river water where she had fallen. Drunk, too, she had attempted to run, to save herself, to drown herself, possibly. Who knows what struggle became too much, sending her out the door into the winter cold. Despair and disgust creased my heart as I got them both inside. The next morning before leaving, I fought through the cigarette smoke and shame that filled the air and dug for the nerve to approach my mom. We didn't talk about hard things in my home, and what I was suggesting felt deceitful. My voice shook as I told her I thought she should consider taking time away from my father to get sober. She didn't believe she could do it. You can do it, I encouraged. I'm petrified. You can do it, mom. Your father is not going to be happy with me. You can do it, mom. It might not work. I might be broken, she whispered. Mom, you can do it. I believe in you. A handful of weeks later, when she called from Memphis, where she had my brother drive her to her parents' home, I sobbed through the phone. I am so proud of you, mom. The next thought came smashing through my words. Holy shit, this is big. I need to talk to my dad. When he answered, I listened as my father's shadows and demons raged over the line. My heart felt like it would implode. The conversation was quick and intense. He was irate. I hung up the phone, sad, conflicted, and worried. But two weeks later, on the morning of February 8th, when he answered, my father's voice was clear. He was no whiskey clear, as he shared in my ear that he was hopeful for the first time in a long while. I respect your mother. She's strong, so beautiful. She did the right thing for us, for our family. We are going to be fine. We are going to get sober and get back on track. Be proud of her. I'll make you proud of me too. I love you, nut. I believed him. He was always my rock, this quiet preacher man who taught me simple ways of living, of being loving, loyal, and strong. That day, I heard a resolve in his voice that had gone missing but seemed amazingly to be found. And so I was smiling. My heart was smiling as I selected and mailed a Valentine's Day card later that afternoon. Looking over the pulpit's edge where my father delivered many sermons and prayers, I wondered who in my small town wasn't in attendance. In a weird attempt to be close to him, I doned a pair of his boxers underneath my dress that were now wedged in my ass crack. And as I unfolded a page of notes, I realized I'd forgotten to spit out my gum. I've already failed this performance, I thought. I didn't ask to be here. I can tell you what you all are thinking. I don't want your pity. Feel sorry for my father. He's the one who fucked up. My heart continued to cave in on itself as I tried to decipher the words I wrote to eulogize a man I both adored and abhorred. My tribute was unintelligible and I was broken open, deeply concerned with what everyone was seeing, such an obvious disaster. I looked at my mom in the front row, heart shattered and eyes empty. I looked at my brother beside her. How is this happening? Where did my family go? Addiction destroyed us. Booze drowned better judgment and silenced any saving grace. It muted memories of love, togetherness, and faith. Poison empowered demons and fueled generational loads of insecurity and shame under which the Petersons were finally leveled. I resent this attention, I thought. It was forced on me. I had no time to prepare. I stumbled through a poem and said my goodbye, and I made up my mind. Fuck love. The day following the memorial service with my mom waiting in the car, I pulled from the mailbox the bright pink envelope elegantly addressed to my dad with my Valentine's message inside, and my heart again splintered. I wasn't enough to save him. Did you even try? Fuck it all. Now you run. And for the next two decades, I ran. The hole in my heart exposed, I cycled for years through grief, shame, and insecurities as excuses to abandon my soul in drinking, sex, and games I played with myself and others. Smart enough to stay ahead of conflict, I fawned and doned whatever mask saved my ass from the consequences. What consequences were mine were downgraded for good behavior, good energy, and good lies. It's not that life didn't reward me with relationships and connections and memories, but no one and nothing got to fool me. I left the church pulpit, but I stayed on a figurative stage, refusing to heal, rebelling against the reality dealt to me. 
Dancing for an invisible audience, I calculated every move to a storyline that never felt like mine. I shamed myself for such fraudulent behavior and punished myself for being caught over rules I hadn't yet broken. Restless and anxious, I drank until I felt pretty, edgy, and aggressive enough to keep the room spinning in a direction I could manage, right-sized, though my eyes couldn't see straight and my head was bobbing, flirting with anything that made me feel wanted and alive. Truth didn't matter. I'd lie if you got too close. Flinch if you touched me. Nothing to see here. Everything is fine. This slow disintegration was my own version of suicide. In the wee hours of a morning nearly five years ago, after bouncing off the curbs, driving home and passing out cold, I awoke to the sound of my own voice above me. You're killing yourself, Natalie. Eyes now open, I wondered at my body splayed below in the bed heart bleeding and mind an absolute mess. I floated to the next room and hovered above my sweet trusting son. There I was looking back from where I'd come and knowing then I could no longer run. My sacred rebel soul knew it was now safe to come undone. Though sobriety made for a clearer head, addiction ran deep and wounds both self-inflicted and at the hands of others festered. I had no problem not drinking. It was the deep inner work I found myself fighting. For some time, I replaced vodka with shopping and marijuana and headed into a dark night of the soul until my sacred rebel finally screamed, enough. Fighting my way to a safe container for healing, a tribe of beautiful humans helped me turn on a new inner light. No longer facing the darkness alone, I have begun to reacquaint myself with the sacred young woman I abandoned. Now safe and in ceremony with others, I have embraced her and held her like she needed to be held so many years ago. I have even reclaimed lost parts of my heart and exclaimed, you're my hero. No more running. I'm walking and healing in my own time, feeling, showing patience, and offering forgiveness with each knot I unwind. Amidst my life's chaos and beauty, the past has begun to meet the present. And in the space between I am love and I am enough, I now reside. Finally, I've come home. And now the medicine. Here's the thing. You are enough. If you're living life believing otherwise, it's time to reflect on this truth. See, you were born enough, and this knowing is yours, not until the outside world of parents, teachers, friends, strangers, social media, and society got in your head with the bullshit of comparisons, Muffling your true voice and fanning the self-limiting beliefs did you begin to question your value. Yes, you are enough. If you're shaking your head, I want to offer you an exercise for remedy. When next you're out, grab a pack of dry erase markers. At least one goes in your bathroom and others go anywhere there's a mirror. Lipstick works too, so does a bar of soap. In large letters and directly in your line of sight, right on your mirror. I am enough. Make it the first thing you see in the morning and the last thing you see as you're readying for bed. On every mirror in the house, write the words there too. Hell, use sticky notes and set random calendar reminders in your phone. Write on the tiles in the shower. Tattoo your arm. When you see the words, repeat them out loud to yourself, if even in a whisper. I mean it. Let yourself hear this. You are enough. It may feel awkward at first, even like you're lying. But said enough times, looking directly into your own eyes, you'll begin to connect with this fundamental truth that resides within you. Deep down, your true self knows. You deserve the peace that comes with this understanding. And the universe sees the beauty you are in being exactly enough. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Quite a story. How did it feel to read it just now? Satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a sad story. Mm -hmm. A bummer. Yeah. But I'm ungrateful. Yeah. Grateful for the 
the strength and resolve uh, that it it left me with, you know, it really, you you know, it, it takes a lot to not want to undo um, some of what life has brought you. And I wished my dad back a thousand times over. Um, but, you know, in my mind, I know that this story is as it should be. Mm -hmm. so yeah that is fine thanks for letting me thank you is there any anything else that you want to say to the audience right now hmm I think we work so hard to be strong and to stay busy and to keep ourselves engaged in things that don't let us get too far down into what feels like the darkness of, um, you know, mistakes or, or regrets or just past actions that we've taken. And I think that the, the healing that can come with investigating and, um, studying our story and, and, sitting with it and sharing it and being vulnerable and, and, um, reclaiming parts of ourselves, as I said, that we've abandoned, um, allows for a lot of light to come in. And, um, it's not to say that it's not easy, um, or that it is easy, excuse me. It's, it's, a it's difficult to take inventory and to, go back into pain and, and sad parts of your life. But I think that there's, there's healing to be had. Um, and it's not about blame. I, I was so sensitive when I wrote this, that my mom, ma my mom who just passed this last October, um, that she, that I'd hurt her feelings, um, with this truth of mine. And, you know, there's a lot of talk, amidst social media and just sound bites that, you know, it's not about blaming your parents and it's, you know, oh, it's this victim and tell it's not that it's our story is, is where our truth is at and, um, reclaiming pieces and, and getting right on the right side of things with ourselves is just, it's critical to our own, um, our own just stability and happiness and clarity and, and sense of worth. So, yeah, I would encourage anybody that's, um, that's thinking about going on, on a, that's embarking on a journey of, of healing to, um, to consider it mightily. Um, it's been very rewarding for me to, to get to this place. So. Beautiful. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Is there anything that you have to offer the audience? You may not, that's okay. But I just wanted to check in. Do you have anything coming up that you would like to share? Any events? Any? Um, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I was sharing with you before we jumped on, um, you know, I have a, a nine to five that keeps me busy, but, um, every millisecond of, of time in between, um, I'm dreaming into, um, being a, an accomplice for good and, and a mentor and, um, and sharing my story and part of my medicine, um, first and foremost for myself, but, um, deciding to put it out there for the world has been through, um, my chat cast, which is called think out loud with me. 
and uh, it's audio only um, and it's visits and conversations and just vulnerable uh, experiences with some really incredible humans um, of all walks. It was, it started as a project to, um, to get out of my own mind and, and connect with others and, and share uh, the magic of, of people that had helped me come out of darkness. And it's turned into conversations with just some really incredible, um, sisters and brothers and, and just humans that are out there doing their best to make the world a better place. Um, so, uh, it comes out sporadically whenever I'm in the mood and whenever I've got somebody cool, uh, to conversate with. So, um, but there's many episodes to listen to and it's on all major directories, whether that's Spotify or Apple or Pandora or Amazon, I'm all over all of them. So, um, I would encourage people and to listen to that at their leisure and be in touch with me. Um, we'll put my contact information I'm sure in, in, uh, the show notes, um, I'm always, always available. Um, I've had my my hand out and accepted by so many people uh, journeying in front of me. And I'm now at a place um, where my hand is extended to anybody that, that I can uh, do the same for. So please be in touch. Truly a gift. And yes, Natalie's information and all of her links, all of the ways to connect with her and including the link to her chat cast is in the notes here. So make sure you check them out. Natalie, thank you. Your Thanks for having me. Will surely change people. Thank you. With that, thank you for joining us on Brave Story Time. Again, my name is Lisa Karasek, moderator of Brave Story Time and community manager for Brave Healer Productions. And with us today was Natalie Peterson, who is in a couple of the books published by Brave Healer Productions. And this was her gift today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.